Today, I'm going to be speaking in the last of the Wisdom Walk series on discernment. Ah. Oh, what a topic. Jesus help us. Uh, somewhat ironic topic because this week uh, there were many moments where I was like, I lack discernment. I need help. So it's, you know, it's always difficult being the preacher when you're preaching on things that you're growing in because I wish I could say to you all, I am the perfected model of discernment in life. I'm not. I'm a human being on a journey just as every single one of us. But I believe God wants to grow me in discernment and he wants to grow us as a community in discernment. And so we're going to apply scripture to our lives. Notice how I said that. So many of us are applying our lives to scripture and then coming out with whatever we like it to say. No, no, we're going to apply the sword of the spirit, the word of God to our lives and allow it to shape us in this moment so that we can grow in discernment together. Jesus says to his disciples and to the crowd in Luke 12, this is just by way of introduction. He said to the crowds, Luke 12, 54, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. When we look at the gray skies in Boston and we feel the fog, we say, rain is coming. I wish I brought my umbrella today. I don't know how many times I've been caught out. It's because I lack discernment, clearly. A shower is coming and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Uh, this is all about discernment. You know how to discern. Oh, there's gray foreboding clouds. I know what that means before it happens, incidentally which is an important part of discernment, <laughs> understanding what you see so that you can interpret it. Because I want to say to you, discernment in hindsight helps nobody, and that's not how discernment works in the Bible. But we'll get to that in a second. We, we will get to that in a minute. But you see the clouds before you feel the raindrop. You know what's coming. Why can't you do that in the spirit? Why can't you do that to the times? Why can't we see COVID as a body and say, I know how to understand what God wants to do in this season rather than discern it through all sorts of brokenness, hearing, oh, this is the judgment of God and hear all these kind of things. It's because the body lacks discernment. But God wants to grow us in discernment. He wants us to be a people who see the times and are able to say why it's happening and what God's intention is in the times. He wants us to see what's happening in our hearts and discern our hearts. He wants us to hear prophetic words and be able to discern them. This is something that he wants to grow in us. I wonder what Jesus would say to us as a community about our discernment. You know what? In many ways, I think he'd encourage us. And in some ways, I'm sure he'd say, come on, let's get mature now. I want to be matured in discernment. And so I am learning along with you. I've said at the beginning of this series, what I'm speaking to you guys about is everything that I'm processing for myself with Jesus at the moment. I'm learning this. I'm weak in some of this, but I want to grow in it. And thank God for the grace of God applied to our lives that allows us to grow in things that we are weak in. Okay, two extremes when we um, approach the idea of discernment. This is all still introduction, don't worry, we'll get to points. I wanna say today, I have no alliteration, which as you know, I feel like increases the spiritual weight of a, of a message, just kidding. But today, whilst I have no alliteration, I do have seven points, and everyone who knows anything about biblical numbers knows seven is the sign of perfection, so this is gonna be power today. I'm joking for anyone who's like, what is this church, anyway. But this is still introduction. I feel like there's two extremes when we approach the idea of discernment, or if you like interpreting, or if you like testing, or if you like weighing. All of those words from biblical standpoint mean the same thing, and we'll, we'll talk about the different nuances in a moment. But there's one extreme in the body which is like a willful ignorance. 
where we, we can even super spiritualize. We can say, well, you know what? 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. One of the gifts of the Spirit is distinguishing between spirits, which means that only a special few who the Spirit gives the ability to are allowed to you know, have that spiritual gift of being able to discern. The rest of us are meant to be clueless by God's design. That is nonsense. That is a, a willful ignorance, okay? Because there's lots of gifts that the Spirit gives that actually Actually, we're instructed to um, exercise as an entire body. So in 1 Corinthians 12, it also says that faith is a gift given by the Spirit. That is true. And there are people who you will meet that carry the gift of faith. You meet them and you can see faith in an in a almost condensed version. It is a Holy Spirit deposit gift of faith. But hey, Everyone in the body is invited to live by faith. So we don't get to say, oh, I don't have the Spirit's gift of faith. So I'm one of those Christians who doesn't operate in faith. That's a lie. You don't read 1 Corinthians 12 and excuse your lack and disobedience of basic instructions in Scripture. The same is true of the gift of healing. 1 Corinthians 12, Holy Spirit gives the gift of healing. But hey, Jesus instructed every believer lay hands on the sick and heal. So I don't get to say, oh, Holy Spirit, poor me. Holy Spirit didn't give me the gift of healing, therefore I won't lay hands on this. You can't disobey Jesus because you want to interpret a verse in a way that suits your um, lack of courage to pray for the sick. We're all instructed to lay hands. And you know what happens? The more you pray for the sick, the more the odds of our seeing healing. That just happens. The more sick people you pray for, the more healing you will see. And you don't actually need a specific gift of healing from the Spirit in order to see sick people healed because it's a basic instruction. Now, there are people who operate in the gift of healing. And again, it's like a condensed version of what every believer is instructed to carry. That's beautiful. It still doesn't excuse the rest of us for not growing in that thing. Same is true of discernment. Oh, Sarah over there is able to distinguish between spirits. Poor me. I just lack discernment. I just don't know what to do. If only Holy Spirit had had. Hey, there are countless instructions in Scripture of training yourself in discernment. We don't get to excuse ourselves because we want to interpret 1 Corinthians 12 in a certain way. So here's one extreme, a willful ignorance. A kind of, oh, I just, I just can't. I talk, talked about this with wisdom, as if some people are born with wisdom, and I'm just one of those who is. That's a lie. Scripture doesn't teach us that. So that's one extreme. We don't want to go there. There's another extreme. Oh, Lord, help us and be on neither side of this, which is basically people growing in suspicion and prideful judgment and calling it discernment. Mm-hmm. If you don't know what I'm talking about, open Instagram, listen to some Christians talking on there. It's very simple. You'll see it all over the place. And we call it discernment. And we're going to talk about the true markers of godly discernment in a moment because suspicion and critique have got nothing to do with godly discernment. We're not invited to be the sort of person where someone says, oh, God said something, and we go, I'll be the judge of that. We're not the scales, But we sometimes meet people and might even be people who act like my heart is the perfect filter for whether God is speaking or not. Oh, this person said God was doing this in the room, but I didn't sense that, so I know he wasn't. Really? (laughs) Wow, how did you get perfect filter of what God is doing and what God isn't? I'd love to grow in that myself. You see people who are full of judgment, who are critical of everything. We'll talk about this more in a second. And they call it discernment. That is a very worldly answer to discernment. Judgment is what it's actually called. And it's not what we're called to do as believers. So there's two extremes that I feel like people might think of when they think of discernment. The person who's kind of arrogantly weighing everything up. That's not biblical discernment. And then the person who's just like, oh, woe is me, I don't have discernment, someone else. That will be someone else's job in the church. It won't be mine. That's also not we're invited into. But we're going to talk about seven markers of biblical discernment. We're going to do a lot of scripture study. It's going to be epic. Okay. First one, godly discernment is extremely active. 
I've got bookmarks everywhere. Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5.14 says this, But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Ha, let's read that again because it's so good. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. See, Godly discernment isn't just a gift that comes upon me or something that I was born with. It is something that I pursue by constant practice. I am training in growing in discernment. Now, the word training here is a word that basically in the Greek um, is literally exercise nakedly, which I'm not Okay, just, whoa, hear me, people. <laughs> hear me. Keep your clothes on, please. Okay? Exercise nakedly. The, the connotation of that word is actually about pro athletes in ancient Greece because they would wear just a loincloth and that is the, how they would train. Their whole, this is not a, uh, a training for a hobby where this isn't me saying I like jogging. Uh, this is an Olympic athlete who runs. There's a difference in the training. This isn't, oh, oh, I'll wake up and I'll think, hmm, do I feel like it is a bit rainy? Nah, not today. I'm going to have a coffee and muffin instead. This is a pro athlete whose livelihood is based on training, who trains whether it's raining, who trains whether it's sunny, who trains whether they have energy, who trains whether they're exhausted, who trains even when they have an injury. Regardless, a pro athlete who is giving themselves to this training. That's what the writer here is saying to the people of God, train in distinguishing good from bad. Train your powers of discernment. There's nothing passive about this. And this isn't to the specific gifted amongst us. This is to the community who want to be mature. Anyone want to pursue immaturity in this community? Because you don't have to do this. But for everybody else who wants to be a grown adult in the church, this we are called to do, which is to actively train in discernment. Wow, that's pretty hard hitting. You can't get the ignorant corner over here of like, I don't get the gift of discernment. No, no, we are all invited to actively keep training. Every part of our life, every moment where something comes up, God is giving us an opportunity to weigh it up, to say, which part of this is good? Which part of this is evil? It's an active engagement of your mind. There's nothing passive about this. If we learn consistently to filter what we're seeing, what we're hearing, and we'll talk about how you filter it in a moment, but we've got to learn that everything God brings before us is an opportunity to grow in discernment muscle. So marker of godly, we'll talk about how to grow it in a second, okay? But marker of godly discernment, it's incredibly active, incredibly active. The second marker is that it stands on transformation. Let's read Romans 12 together. All of this is going to come together. Trust me, we're going to get there. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Okay, so you, you, there's some transformation around that, our thinking that needs to happen. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, the thing is, the refusal to conform, the acceptance of renewing our minds and being transformed therefore becomes the foundation by which we are then able to test 
so that we may discern the will of God. Discernment requires a foundation of refusing to conform to the thinking of the world and pursuing rather a transformation of our minds through the renewal of how we think. The problem is for many of us, we have seen discernment come through people who have absolutely conformed to the thinking of this world. Discernment cannot operate through that lens of thinking. Because the way of the world is cancel culture. The way of the world is critique. The way of the world is fearfulness. All of those things will dirty the lens through which you are trying to discern what you see. You have to refuse to give in to what the way the world thinks. You have to pursue a renewing of your mind, which ultimately is your responsibility, nobody else's. I don't have control of your mind. You have control of your mind. And similarly, you don't have control of my mind, I do. Renewing of your mind is not a passive reality. It is something that we fully engage with because it is our responsibility. When I see Jesus face to face, I'm not going to be able to say to him, oh, you know, the renewing of my mind, that was a really tricky one because Julian didn't help me well. You should, you should really deal with Julian. He didn't do good on that one. No, there's no one to point to. Whose mind is it? Whose mind is it? The person who owns it has the responsibility to renew it. (laughs) You know, it's like when I drive our car all the time while Julian is away. Then Julian comes home and he literally gets into the car, turns the ignition on, and the tank is empty. This is just public confession. It's good. Confess your sins one to another. You will be healed. I'm confessing my sins. Whose responsibility was that gas tank? Yeah, that's right. I was the one driving all week. So I can't say to Julian, hey, why didn't you do more for this? I was the one driving. But many of us, we're the ones driving. We're the owner of the car. Then it gets to empty or there's a light bulb. And we act like it's someone else's responsibility. You're driving, fill the gas tank. Your mind, renew how you think. It's very simple. It's not complicated. Why do we abdicate responsibility as believers? (laughs) Discernment requires you to refuse to think the way the world thinks. So when I'm watching videos of someone being judgmental, judgmental, critical, um, inviting others to expose believers everywhere, whether their information is correct or not is irrelevant to me. They are operating in something that is not godly discernment. They are operating in demonic discernment because the first step that they should have done, which is refuse to conform to the ways of the world they have not done. Therefore, their discernment is impure. I don't care what information you have to hand. How are you thinking? Show me that the way you're thinking is different to the way the world thinks and then we could talk your discernment. That's why sometimes people come to me and I'm not saying I'm perfect on this, incidentally, but I'm just saying when people come to me from the community and they say, I've discerned a few things about this community. Pastor Katia, I need to talk to you about this. Uh, My discernment is up. There are some questions I have before they tell me what they're discerning. Because if they're operating in a spirit of judgment, if they're operating in fear, if they're operating in things that are ungodly in and of themselves, their discernment is off. It's irrelevant whether they have accurate information. Their lens is wrong. Discernment stands on transformation. We've got to build one on top of the other. Renew your mind. Refuse to conform to the way of the world. And then practice discernment. It will help you. Third, discernment from a godly standpoint embraces bias. (laughs) See, the word that is used in Romans here, that by testing you may discern what is the will of the Lord. It's a word, did I write it down? Ah, Let's be honest, you're going to forget it anyway. I did. 
dokimezo. I don't even know if that's how it's pronounced, but just so you know that I'm not making it up. That's the Greek word. It's a word that basically means um, a testing to prove what is good, or a different way, to demonstrate what is good. Essentially, it's a word that is good focused, not trying to expose bad because it's biased already to believe there is good. Now, the thing about this here, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. Essentially, the assumption here is that the will of God is good. So I'm not testing it to be the scales. I'll be the judge of that, God. Hmm. Is your word good or not? I'll be the judge of it. Let me discern what scripture says. I'll be the judge of of the standard here. That's not how it works. The word that's used here is basically as you're testing to find the will of God, you have a bias already that you have chosen to adopt, which is God's will is good. God's will is perfect. God's word is good. God's word is perfect. Therefore, I apply it to me in the testing rather than I will be the judge of it in the testing. Does this make sense? This is important because if not, we will allow ourselves to be the judge of everything rather than allow ourselves to use the word of God as the judge of everything. There's a difference. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole deconstruction scenario, but one thing I want to say is there is an inherent problem in a way of thinking which questions everything. Questions are good. It depends on the attitude of your heart. But if you have decided that the level of your questioning can also include what God is like, what God says about himself, that you will be the judge of that, the problem is you're not doing what we're being invited into. You have given up on the bias that needs to be inherent in the people of God as soon as you've lost that bias you have stepped back from the only thing that is actually an accurate weighing system then you're lost that's like me trying to bake a cake without scales I'll be the judge of that. Is this 100 grams of flour I'll be the judge of it Uh, okay good luck to you bake a cake let's see how it works You're not the judge of it because you're not accurate in your measurement. The word of God is accurate in its measurement. The Holy Spirit is accurate in his measurement. If you think that you will judge him more accurately than he will judge you, you have a problem. I'll be the judge of that. Cannot, cannot enter into our discernment. We must be a people who pursue the word, who apply it to us, not the other way around. I hope this is making sense. Embrace this bias. It's part of discernment for the people of God. Fourth one. So we have it's active. It stands on transformation. It embraces bias. Godly discernment, fourthly, invites community. I keep saying the same thing and I'm not trying to be mean or one track. It's just everywhere in scripture. Trying to be a believer in isolation is like shooting your own kneecaps and then trying to run a race. Not easy to do. Community is how God has designed the race to be run. Now, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 14 together. I really want to invite you to be writing these verses down. Chew on them. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 is a passage, well, 12, 13, 14. Lots of spiritual gifts is the conversation. And in 1 Corinthians 14, there's this instruction to us in response to the prophetic. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. Let two or three prophets speak. We love the prophetic in this community. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this in in a greater sense in a moment. But... 1 Corinthians 14, having described the prophetic, it then, or 12, 13, and 14, it talks about in verse 29, an essential component to the prophetic. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others, 
plural, weigh what is said. That weighing is again, a testing, a discerning. This is all about discernment. So when a prophet speaks or when someone who is prophetic operates in their gift, what happens is the essential second part of the prophetic gift has to operate for it to be meaningful, which is weighing. We weigh what is given. We have discernment over what is spoken. Why? Well, because amongst other things, 1 Corinthians 13, 9 says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So there's an understanding that the prophetic that is released in the community, it has two components, which is one person operates in their gift. They release something. They're not using words like this is 100% the word of God. And if you disobey it, you are in sin because that's not a New Testament paradigm of the prophetic. There's an understanding that we will prophesy in part. But that's when the second essential component of the prophetic kicks in, which is hello discernment. I get invited to lots of church communities all over the world and often I get asked about the prophetic as Julian does. And one of the things that I've seen many, many, many times over is believers complaining about how much damage the prophetic does. I want to correct something there. I do not believe the prophetic gift is the problem here. I believe it is the absence of weighing in how we train our people. So someone can come in and say, this is the word of the Lord. And because we have not trained our people to discern, our people are now completely vulnerable to the word of the Lord because they haven't understood that the prophetic is a two person dance in the Bible. You release the word and you weigh it. They both have to happen. In fact, Paul talks about earlier about how um, speaking in tongues in a community setting is the same thing in that you shouldn't have a spoken tongues out declaration if you're not going to have someone to interpret the word because the first gift, whilst it might have been accurate, is nonsense without the interpretation. And then he talks about the prophetic in the same light. Don't release prophecy if you're not going to do the weighing because prophecy requires the weighing in order for it to do what it's meant to do, which is to build. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to say to you, now I've gone beyond where I was wanting to go for this point, but the point that's really important here for us to see is the plurality of the others who weigh. When you have a Christian who is consistently discerning in isolation they're going to run into trouble. Because actually, now I understand, there are occasions where no one else has been in the room. Like I'm not saying always there's a whole group that's got to be involved. But there is a reality that in general, our discernment requires other people who are running a race alongside us. Because it's a community endeavor for it to be healthy. If you have no interest in the community of believers and yet you are, you feel, very high on discernment, you are unbiblical in how you discern. You're already in trouble. Like, I don't need to know anything else. If someone comes to me, says to me they have a great gift of discernment, and I ask them where their community is, and they say, oh, no, I don't believe believe in the church. But what I do know is God speaks to me really clearly. Uh Uh-uh, it's unbiblical. You can't build from an unbiblical foundation. There's so many of us ignoring the foundations and then running ahead. You can't do it. It doesn't work. Godly discernment invites community. We weigh together. So in this church, when someone publicly releases a word, just so you know what happens, The leadership team get together. There's a few of us. We pray together weekly and we we weigh the word. We say, how do you weigh a word? Okay, let's get super practical. How do you weigh a word? First, we ask each other, does this sound like Jesus? Now that requires that we know enough about what the voice of Jesus sounds like because we've been reading our Bibles. So we're able to say, does it match up with how Jesus talks? How does Jesus talk? Well, he doesn't like religion, but he loves people and he invites people into impossible things the whole time. 
okay? So first of all, plausibility isn't how you weigh a word because if it sounds like Jesus, it's likely to be impossible because that's what he sounds like all of the time, okay? So when you're weighing a word and you say, does this sound likely, your filter to weigh is already incorrect because you don't know that the voice of Jesus rarely sounds likely. Okay, does it sound like Jesus? That's a good Good marker. Is it full of love? Is it doing what the prophetic says that it will do, which is the intention is building? 1 Corinthians 14, we'll talk about this in a second. We'll get there. I love the building element. It repeats building all the time. So if, it's, if a word is released that is n- nonsense for building, it's not very useful. Okay? So is it helpful for building? Another really practical way that I can't explain from scripture, but I can explain from my experience with the prophetic, and Julian teaches on this really excellently, is to um, decipher between the content and the word and the context of the word. Now, I want to explain this to you because this, yeah, we've got time and this is important, I think. I don't think we talk about this enough, so I want to do this. Years ago, I was given a prophetic word by someone, really amazing, recognized prophetic voice. She spoke to me in a season where God had already been speaking to me. Uh, For those who don't know, I used to be an emergency doctor. I worked in a hospital setting. uh, But God had started speaking to me about doing what I'm doing now, about entering into full-time vocational ministry. You understand everyone is in ministry, but just doing what I'm doing now. Anyway, so I already had this sense. The time on medicine, God has called it. I need to step out in faith in what he has called me to do, to preach, to teach, to operate in signs and wonders. I knew that. Anyway, so she saw me in a meeting and she started prophesying over me. And the first thing she said is, God is giving you a promotion in medicine. God is going to allow you to write books about patients that you see. God is going to give you increasing favor in the hospital, right? The the word continued and continued. The more she talked, the more my heart sank. Because I was like, God doesn't know. I'm so confused right now. I respect this person. I know they carry a prophetic gift. For months, I've been journeying with Jesus. So either I can't hear him, which is depressing enough already, or God is now changed his mind, which is heartbreaking because my heart has been won to this thing that he's been calling me to. Or this person is false, which is already also concerning because this person prophesies a lot to lots of the turmoil in my heart. She's speaking and speaking. My heart is getting more and more anxious. She finished. We went into a meeting. We were at a conference, worship time. I'm just crying. I, I'm so confused. I'm so anxious where I was full of faith. And now I'm like, I don't know what to do. I feel like I've been spun around. I don't even understand. Do I even hear him? Does he even speak? All the things. It was Kerry, when you read about David being so dramatic, 100% me. <laughs> How long? All over? That is, that's literally me. Anyway, so in that moment, I'm now crying. I was so happy 10 minutes ago. I don't even know if God exists anymore. That's me. <laughs> And then I have a quick chat with Julian. We were, I think we were, I can't remember. We were dating at the time. And I just said to him, I honestly am really struggling. And he said to me, decipher between the content and the context of the word. And I was like, huh. Okay, so this is what you do. She knew I was a doctor. So she's seeing content, promotion, favor, book writing, upgrade. She's filtering it through a context that she knows. Upgrade in medicine, favor in the workplace, book writing about patients. You suddenly divide those two things and content is exactly what God had been speaking to me about. We prophesy in part. She understood the context. She applied it incorrectly. But it doesn't mean her word was incorrect because the content was exactly right. I've written a book That was promised that day. I've got more books in me that are promised that day. I have seen God do miracles. I have experienced favor and upgrade from that moment. So what she said was true. It was just context was wrong. So when you're weighing, it's helpful to decipher content versus context because you might ignore prophetic words that are right. It's just the person has put them in a context that is wrong. Weighing, super practical. Go through your prophetic word. What of this word is something that I can practically steward right now? Because there's going to be an element that you can steward. 
what part of this word is stuff that only God can do. I prophesy that you will be the best preacher on the planet. Wonderful. Here's what you need to steward then is to start writing sermons before anyone asks you to preach one. That's how you steward a word like that. You don't sit and go, well, God will make me the best preacher on the planet. I'm not going to study my Bible. I'm not going to write any sermons because God will miraculously lift me up in the spirit, place me on a platform that everyone in the world will watch and then I will be famous. That's not how words work. But that's what many of us are doing with our prophetic words. Oh, that's so lovely. God will do it. Okay, off to the next thing. And then we're wondering why we're never seeing breakthrough because you're not trustworthy to weigh your prophetic words. How many people I've heard say to me, God told me this would be it. I'm like, wonderful, what have you done with that word? How many sermons have you written? Oh, none. Well, good luck with being the best preacher on the planet then. It's never going to come to pass because prophetic words aren't a formula that God randomly applies to your life at any given moment and then ching, you're that thing. That's not how he works. He likes to partner with you. You have to apply and steward the word in order, right? So when you receive a prophetic word from God and you release it to the community, this is how we're thinking as a core team. These are the steps we're applying, right? What do we do? Kindle released a word to us a year ago. Well, actually two words to us that have really helped build the community. About whatever it was, maybe six months ago now, he released a word about God growing the community, tripling things. Well, what did we do? As a team, we said we need a bigger room. We don't say we'll wait until we'll triple in the room that you are stuck with the person next to you. It's the most uncomfortable experience ever. And then we'll say, oh, great, God did what he did, so now we need a bigger venue. No, no, you build for it. You say, what can we steward? I cannot somehow manipulate people into this building. Well, I probably could. I could pay them to enter. It wouldn't be very useful. The point is, but what I can do from that prophetic word is, how do I steward this? I create space for the numbers to come. Okay. I hope this is helping you. The point was, invites community. (laughs) Don't discern in isolation. I I went left field, but it's good. Um, Number five of godly discernment walks with love and knowledge. Philippians 1. Philippians 1 says in verse 9, it is my prayer, Paul is writing to the community in Philippi, that your love may abound more and more. Uh, Notice often then when love is talked about, it goes first. It's because it's the most important. That is how it works. It's the foundational element of these things, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness. Discernment cannot stand alone. It needs to be flanked with love and knowledge. This is why you need to read your Bible. Discernment without biblical knowledge is useless. You won't understand the information you have. You need knowledge. Read your Bible gain knowledge from scripture, it will help you. But also discernment in the absence of love leads to what the world does, which is let me just judge you, let me get rid of you, let me spit you out because what you're saying isn't good. No, no, that's not how godly discernment operates. Why? Because love abounds in it. So there's no room for critical judgment and canceling people out, no matter what you're discerning, because it's flanked by love and knowledge. Discernment is not meant to be an ingredient that's used on its own. It is an ingredient part of a trio. Use it together or don't use it at all. Biblical discernment, as we train in it, we've got to grow in love, we've got to grow in knowledge in order to operate in godly discernment. Love is foundational. Perfect love casts out fear. That's why it's foundational, because fear-filled discernment is just suspicion. It's just suspicion because everything, all information that you hear, you filter through a fear-filled lens expecting the worst. And you meet Christians like that. Everything they discern is bad. Oh, don't listen to that person. I've discerned a few things about them. I can tell you later if you want. Oh, I discerned about that prophetic word. Don't follow it. There's some, those people, when someone is consistently only discerning the negative, there's something off. 
Because actually the Bible invites us to discern for the positive. What's the good in that thing? Because if you cannot discern the good, there's a problem. And I'm going to guess that there's a problem in love. Because you're fear-filled. So all you see is the negative. All you see is suspicion. That's not biblical discernment. It doesn't operate in that way. Okay, number six. Biblical discernment is the opposite of despising something. Again, worldly discernment is often despising things. That's not how it works in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22. Where are you, Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22. Oh, no, I've gone to Hebrews. That's wrong. Don't go to Hebrews yet. There we go. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Now, we might think despising prophecies is just saying, oh, I hate the prophetic. Do you know how you actually despise prophecies? By not testing it. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. It's giving you the opposite of despising, which is to weigh. In charismatic circles, we're often like, we love the prophetic. If you're not weighing the prophetic, you're actually despising it. You have to weigh it to honor it. You have to test it. That's a biblical command. Don't despise it. How do you despise it? Not by saying, oh, we don't allow the prophetic in our church. That's, that's one way, but that's not actually the biblical definition of how to despise the prophetic. It's, a, it's our own d- way of doing it. But an actual biblical definition of despising isn't that we don't allow you to prophesy, it's that when you prophesy, we don't weigh it. That book of prophecies that you have that is gaining dust somewhere on a shelf somewhere, you're actually despising those words if you're not weighing them. No matter how many times you've written them over. We have to weigh. But see here, biblical discernment is the opposite of despising. Worldly discernment despises people. It's angry. It's mean. That's not how biblical discernment works because it's actually the antidote to despising. It doesn't fall in line with it. Do you understand how different it is from what so many believers would call discernment? Which is cruel and mean and puts other people down. No, that's not what biblical discernment looks like because it's the antidote to that. Last one. Hope you guys are doing okay. Number seven. Perfection. Number seven. (laughs) Biblical discernment is a building tool. It is something in your toolbox to build with. This is why discernment in hindsight means nothing at all because you can't build in hindsight. It's like buildings that were built poorly going to fix in The things that were done wrong is a nightmare because you don't build in hindsight. You build intentionally. Mm -hmm. You don't build with the wrong materials. If you do, the thing falls down. It's not helpful to build with hindsight. Oh, I knew that. Oh, yeah, that person was in sin. I actually discerned something. Don't ever come and tell me stuff like that because it will drive me nuts. You are using a building tool far too late. It is not helpful late. It's only helpful if you see the cloud out of your window and you say it's going to rain, let me take an umbrella. It is not helpful when you're on your way to work and it starts pouring on you and you go, oh yeah, I thought it was going to rain. Well, then you should have got an umbrella. That's what the discernment is for. It's not so that we can high five each other because now that it's been confirmed, I can tell you I was really spiritual, so I felt it. Don't tell me that. It is not spiritual. It's in disobedience to scripture because you didn't build with it. Because we do that. I know because I do that. (laughs) We like the sound of it. I knew that was going to happen. Oh, good. What did you do with it? Because don't tell me you knew if you didn't do anything with it. (laughs) Because the only reason to communicate that in that moment is to make yourself seem spiritual to the people who are hearing you. 
because you can't do anything with it. It only makes you look good. But it only makes you look good to those who don't know scripture enough. So grow in knowledge so that you can say to that person, hey, it's interesting you say that. So you were disobedient to scripture by not building with it. That would be a great antidote in this community to any of that kind of hyper-spiritual nonsense, which is I knew that would happen. Good for you. So basically what you've just confessed is that you were disobedient. Let's pray about that and God will forgive your sin. Why do I get so feisty when I get a microphone? I don't know what happens. I, well, I wonder where Eva gets it from. Absolutely, Lord Jesus, help us. You guys, I, I am touching on something that has become a pseudo-charismatic culture, which is awful, which is all about my ego and has nothing to do with building. Don't tell me how many prophetic words you had in hindsight. I'm not interested. I'm telling you, we will start a culture that actually picks up the disobedience of that. We will not say, oh, that person's really prophetic because they always have a sentence afterwards. That's not prophetic. Mm -hmm. Prophecy and discernment in hindsight doesn't help. Don't come and say to me today, oh, you know, about two months ago, I felt you should preach on wisdom. Because all I'll say is, why were you disobedient to the word that you received? <laughs> that will change things quickly. Why? Because we have to maintain the integrity of what God is giving. And we are actually rubbishing the integrity and building our own egos rather than faithfully using the tool to build. It's for building. Read 1 Corinthians 14. Building is used multiple times in that chapter, both around the prophetic and about weighing. Discernment is a building gift. You don't believe me? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14 again. We're going to land here. Ugh, I took out my bookmark. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love. Again, notice I'm starting with 1 Corinthians 14. 14, one. You guys okay? We're going to do two more minutes. Pursue love. You know 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter on love, isn't meant to be a sweet poem that is read at weddings. It is meant to be the foundation through which you operate in all spiritual gifts. Therefore, when Paul says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, so many of us skip over pursue love as if, oh, that's sweet, earnestly desire the gifts. If you haven't got love, don't go anywhere near the gifts, please. You will cause so much damage with something that you're not able to handle. Pursue love. It is foundational. It is the first step. Don't skip it. Pursue love. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. So it's biblical to be zealous for gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in tongues, speaks not to men but to God. He goes on. But I'm going to start picking up. Verse 3 is for upbuilding and encouragement. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. The one who prophesies builds up the church. Verse uh, 5, right at the end, so that the church may be built up. Then he goes on, he's teaching, he's teaching. Verse 26, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, which is essentially the weighing component, the discernment component. Let all things be done for what? For building up. Whatever gift you have, if it builds your ego but does not build the church, it does not belong at the table community. Because the gifts are for building up. That's why you can't prophesy in hindsight. That's why you can't prove your discernment in hindsight. You haven't built with it. Don't apply it. Seven components. It's active. Hebrews 5.14. It stands on transformation, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It embraces bias, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It invites community, 1 Corinthians 14, 29. It walks with love and knowledge, Philippians 1, 9 to 11. Six, it is the opposite of despising, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22. And seven, it is a building tool, 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. I don't know about you, but I need to grow in discernment. You know, Holy Spirit invites us into things that he wants to empower. He's not dangling this in front of us because we can't achieve this. He's giving us a gift that he wants us to pursue and exercise. 
Let's be a community that practices discernment. Grow in love, church. Grow in knowledge, church. Exercise discernment. Let's stand together. Hey, thanks for watching this video. It's part of my 12 session online school called Vox Day. Head over to voxdayschool.com to find out a little bit more about this and join us for our next live session.